Let my prayer come into your presence. Incline your ear to my cry for help, O Lord. Psalm 88, verse 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. As we begin to celebrate these sacred mysteries this morning, one of the, I have two quick announcements. One is, I know we have announcements at the end, but just to, just to uh, get this out there, um, this upcoming Thursday, December 6th, November 16th, uh, we have our, our day of thanks. It, it is the one day we're up here at the University of Minnesota Duluth Catholic Campus Ministry, our Newman Center, our Bulldog Catholic. It's the one day that we really kind of have a fundraiser. And so um, not only is that our fundraiser day, where you can go to bulldogcatholic.org and donate, or you could go to givemn.org and donate, um, but also it's a day that that night on Thursday, November 16th, again, it's coming up pretty quick, uh, Thursday, December, December 16th at 7 o'clock um, online here on the, the platform of the YouTube. Uh, there should be a link in this whole th in this in this mass. Um, we're going to have a, an hour, an hour just where there's an opportunity for Q&A. A A lot of times this is kind of one way, right? I mean, we're praying together, but a lot of times uh, it's like, I have a question, Father, or I would like to ask you about this or that other this and that and the other thing. And so on that same day of thanks, where we're trying to support uh, Bulldog Catholic, our ministry up here at the University of Minnesota Duluth, we're also going to be hosting that event Thursday, November 16th at 7 p.m. Central Time um, online. So please join us. It'd be awesome. You, just, you can write in your questions. We have some students who are going to help us out, some missionaries to help us out to kind of just you know, field those questions and answer those questions. I'll do my best to uh, just, just be there, to be there and, and be with you and pray with you and answer whatever kind of questions you have. So that's upcoming this Thursday, November 16th, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. Um, just again, check the notes below for some more information. The other is more... Yeah, the other announcement is, is more oriented towards what we're doing. We're here to worship the Lord. But just a reminder, I say this too often, maybe not too often, but every one of these Masses is offered for you. It's offered for you because a lot of times the people who are joining us are unable to get to Mass in person. And so that means you're probably going through some kind of trial in their, your life right now or some kind of stress, some kind of sickness, some kind of battle in your life. And so please know that you are not alone in this trial. You're not alone in this battle. You're not alone in this sickness. We are praying with you. We're praying for you. So as we enter into this prayer, we call upon the Lord, wherever you are right now, to ask the Lord to meet you with his mercy, with his strength, with his healing help. Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, graciously keep from us all adversity so that unhindered in mind and body alike, we may pursue in freedom of heart the things that are yours. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
God forever and ever. Amen. But you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Resplendent and unfading is wisdom, and she is readily perceived by those who love her, and found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of their desire. Whoever watches for her at dawn shall not be disappointed, for he shall find her sitting by his gate. For taking thought of wisdom is the perfection of prudence, and whoever for her sake keeps vigil shall quickly be free from care. Because she makes her own rounds, seeking those worthy of her, and graciously appears to them in the ways, and meets them with all solicitude. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. O God, you are my God whom I seek. For you my flesh pines and my soul thirsts, like the earth, parched, lifeless, and without water. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. Thus I have gazed towards you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory, for your kindness is, greater, is a greater good than life. My lips shall glorify you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. Thus I will bless you while I live. Lifting up my hands, I will call upon your name, as with the riches of a banquet shall my soul be satisfied. And with the exultant lips, my mouth shall praise you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. I will, remember upon, I will remember you upon my couch, and through the night watches I will meditate on you. You are my help, and in the shadow of your wings I shout for joy. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest, who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell you this, and on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely, surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with the word of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be Jesus. to God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, but the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake. For you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. I should have a seat. So, um, 
So when it comes to like things like good news or bad news, there's that question like, you know, if, if someone has good news and they have bad news, they always ask the question like, do you want the good news first or the bad news first? Um, and I don't know. I don't know what, what I want. I think typically I would say, give me the bad news first because like it's, it, because it's only going to get better. Um, I don't know. People are different when it comes to like, sometimes people say, I don't want the bad news at all. I just, <laughs> just give me the good news, um, which actually brings rise, gives rise to like a whole bunch of jokes. You know, the, the, there's good news, bad news jokes. Like there was one that was, um, you know, someone says, uh, this man went to go skydiving and the guy ran the, ran the, the whole show. He had said, talked to this man's wife and he said, Hey, I've got some, uh, I've got some bad news and some good news and then some, some worse news and, and some better news. And she said, okay, tell me what, 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 what is it? And she, and he says, well, um, your husband went, went with us and, uh, he fell out of the plane. That's the bad news. The good news is he had a parachute on. Uh, the bad news is the parachute didn't open. And the good news is we hadn't taken off yet. It's like, it's, okay, crickets over here. I just, I know. Okay, be, be, a better one, a better, better one is, is I, I like this one. Um, the doctor says to the, the patient, like, I've got some good news and some bad news. And he says, well, give me the, what's the good news? The good news is uh, you have 24 hours to live. What's the bad news? I've been trying to get a hold of you since yesterday. Right? Okay. So then, <laughs> the, the third one is, is there's a good, the doctor, good news and bad news, the patient. What's the, what's the good news? The good news is they're going to name the disease after you. Right? So, so we have all these. I appreciate this. Um, but we have this. We have good news and bad news. You know, last week we started talking about the story, right? The good news, right? The gospel. We asked the question, do we know the gospel? Like, do we know the good news? Because as St. Paul was writing to the Thessalonians last week, he said, he said, you know, there's a story. There's good news. The Evangelion, right? Evangelion of Caesar was that the Pax Romana was there. But that's not, that's not good news. The good news is that actually Jesus himself has conquered death. He is, he's, he's come to this earth. He suffered. He died. He rose from the dead. That's the good news. And then this is, we realize this is a true story. And because this is a true story, we get to base our lives. We get to base our decisions. We get to base our hopes. We get to base our fears. We get to base our, our, our celebrations on this true story. So that's the, the, the series we started last week, right? The good news. We get to base our lives on this good news. And again, we're not the first. The Thessalonians here that St. Paul's writing to, he continues to write to them today. And I just want to put this in context. They had the good news. Preach them. The Evangelion, right? The Evangelion. That means good news. They had this preached to them and they believed it. As Paul's writing to them today, they had a little tension here. Because the, 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 the story they were basing their lives on, right? The, the true story they were basing their lives on is that Christ had conquered death, but then they actually experienced death. So in what St. Paul's writing to them today, he's saying, okay, I know that some of you are troubled. Why? You're troubled because you bet you had the good news preached to you and the good news is that Jesus Christ has conquered death, but now you've experienced death and you're afraid now. You're afraid that, wait a second, if those among us who have believed in Christ have died, does that mean that they won't be raised? That's why St. Paul's writing to them today because they've heard the good news and they're wondering, is there more? Because the others die and we die. So what's different? That's why St. Paul writes to them today and he says, what's different is you don't grieve like those who have no hope. That's the key. That, yeah, we grieve. As Christians, as those who believe, have based our lives on this true story, we grieve when we encounter death. But we don't grieve like those who have, don't know the good news. And as he says it, we, don't, we do not grieve like those who have no hope. Why? Because our lives are based on a true story. And so what we heard last week, and we heard Act 1. Act 1 of the true story is what? It's a couple things. One, that God is one and God is good. That God cares, that God loves, that God creates. And he creates this world freely. He creates this world. He creates it completely good, right? He just speaks and there's light and it's good. He speaks and there's life and it's good. And then when he makes us so critical, he doesn't make us for slavery. He actually makes us for freedom. And this is, this is act one. This is part of the good news. It's part of the Evangelion, right? He not only makes us for freedom, he goes on to say, he makes us on purpose. He makes us for purpose. And he makes us in his image and likeness. And I always think about that. Like, what's the purpose? What, what, what is it to be made in God's image and likeness? Well, I think if you go back and read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, the stories of creation, you realize pretty quickly that God makes us for three things. He makes human beings for labor, for leisure, and for love. 
Like, just pause on this for just a second. This is Act 1. Act 1 is, is that God makes us for labor and, and recognition. Why? Well, because God creates, God works, and he wants us to create. He wants us to work. He wants us to be like him. And so he puts man in the garden. He says, I put you here to cultivate and to care for it. He actually, not, not as a slave, though, but as I would do this. You get, here's what human beings get to be on this earth is we get to be a, an image and likeness of the God who creates, of the God who builds things, of the God who ha- has this imagination and, and puts it into being. So, so God makes us to labor so we can be like him. Then he gives us leisure, right? That on the seventh day, God rested. And what does he do? He invites us into that rest as well. So God makes us for labor, makes us to rest, makes us for leisure, and makes us for love. I mean, this is, I mean, how, how, clear as that where here's the man by himself. What does God say? It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a suitable help me for him so that these two will love each other. When the man wakes up from that deep sleep and he sees the woman for the first time, he's like, at last, this one is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. This is the reason. Like, this is, this is it. God makes us for labor, for leisure, and for love. And they had that. That's the, that's the remarkable thing. Is they had that. They, scripture goes on to say, Genesis 2, it says, that they would walk in the garden with God. They had that relationship with him. They're made for a relationship, but they got to love God. In fact, they got to love each other too. The very last line of Genesis chapter 2 is, The man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. They were whole. They were, they were free. And that, that's, that's the good news. That's the first part of the story. That's act one. Um, the bad news is, the Bible's longer than two chapters, right? The bad news is, uh, chapter three came along. And we move into act two. And act two is where that good news, Evangelion, right? Where we have the bad news. And the bad news could be something like kakengelion. It's another Greek word. It's a kind of Greek word that's made up. There's not a Greek word for the bad news. But it would be the kakengelion. And what is that? In chapter 3, it says, well, the serpent was the most clever of all the animals the Lord God had made. And now was the serpent a representat- representation of that? The serpent's a representation of the devil. And the devil, remember this. Remember the devil's a fallen angel. God makes everything good. So all the angels, God makes good. And he pours into them his beauty and his power. He pours into them his intellect. He pours into them his will. He pours into them all goodness. But at one point, one angel, Lucifer, used that goodness and that intellect and that power and that freedom to say no to God. And scripture says something like that, that he, then that Lucifer, led a, a whole number of angels in rebellion against God. So keep this in mind, that the devil was an angel created for good, created for love, and created free with the freedom to say no, and then he did say no. That's why the Book of Wisdom says this. It says that God did not make death. This is all important for us. That in the garden, Adam and Eve, they didn't have death. They didn't have, they have paper cut. They didn't have wounds. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. The next line says, but through the envy of the devil, death entered the world. And what does he do? The devil is a liar. He's, he lies. He accuses. He deceives and he discourages. We know this about Satan that he lies and he deceives. He accuses and he discourages. And I I don't know about this, if you've ever thought about the most powerful lies that we have in our lives. I mean, the most powerful lies, um, if you've ever paid attention, they always, lies are always false, right? That's why they're lies. But if there's a lie that's completely false, it can hurt, right? Someone says a lie and it's it's completely false. It can hurt, but it's kind of like a a needle, like it just kind of pokes you and that hurts, but it goes right out, comes right out, because it's just completely false. The worst lies, the most destructive kind of lies, are false, but they have a little bit of truth in them. And that truth is, is the barb, right? So it's more like the powerful lies are like hooks. Again, if it's just a complete lie, it's a needle, hurts, comes right out though. But a lot of times the lies that ruin our lives are the ones that have a little bit of truth in them. And that little truth is enough to get stuck in our, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and that can have the destruction. See, that's the thing about Satan. He will tell lies with some truth. That's why he's the deceiver. And so what happens in the Genesis 3 is the liar, the deceiver, the accuser, the discourager, he comes in, he comes to the talk to the woman and he asks the question, did God really say you couldn't eat of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Think about that. That's, that's partly true, mostly false. 
And Eve even knows that. She says, no, God said we could eat of any of the trees except for that one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if we eat it, we'll die. And then here's where, here's where the accuser, the tempter comes out, the deceiver, the liar, and says, you'll certainly not die. No, God knows full well that the moment you eat of it, you'll be like him. And the inference here is that and God doesn't want you to be like him, which is completely ironic because why? Because here are Adam and Eve and they're already created in God's image and likeness. God has already poured his, his love into their lives. He's already made them like him. And here is the accuser, the deceiver, who says God doesn't want you to be like him. And that kind of a lie can get into our hearts. That God doesn't love you. He just wants to use you. And it turns out that our first parents were easy to deceive. And they sinned. And, and the, the, for, I think for a lot of us, we're like, yeah, but like, they, they ate a piece of fruit. I mean, that's the scriptural you know, way to represent this. If no one was hurt. I don't know if you've ever thought of this. I remember thinking about this when I was younger. I was like, well, are you kidding me? They ate a piece of fruit. Like, no one was hurt. How can this be a sin if no one was hurt? Well, first thing, we need to define sin. Uh, the definition of a sin is not when someone gets hurt. The definition of a sin is a breaking of a relationship, right? It's that sense of saying, God, I know what you want. This is my definition for sin. God, I know what you want. I don't care. I want what I want. God, I know what you want. It's not an accident. It's not a mistake. I know what you want, but I want what I want. And then the second thing is we say, like, define hurt. No one was hurt. Define hurt. This choice broke the world. This choice broke the world. It broke our relationship with God. This choice broke our relationship with each other. And immediately they cover themselves up, the man and the woman, and even breaks our own hearts. I mean, think about this. Every good thing that you've been made for, every good thing that we've been made for has become twisted now. So remember, in the garden, Genesis 1 and 2, the good news before this cacangelion, before this bad news, before this evil news, it also becomes twisted. We're made for labor, for leisure, for love. What's our experience of labor now? Our experience of labor is either one of two extremes, right? Our experience of labor is either drudgery or it's everything. It's either, it's either just this work that is pointless and fruitless. I think about how often I talk to students who, like, that's as they graduate, go off into the workforce. It's like, well, I have this job, and it's just kind of like, it's kind of pointless, it's like it doesn't do anything, or, or, or it's fruitless. It doesn't make anything. Like in the, it's either pointless or fruitless. It, it, it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't do anything. Or, or the opposite extreme of the distortion, and it's my identity. It's everything to me. And I talk to so many people, not only who are starting out their work, but in their midlife or at the end of their careers, they're saying, okay, I gave my whole life to this career, I gave my whole life to this work, and I realize I took my, that was my identity. That's a twisting. So God made us for labor, but not for drudgery. God made us for labor, but not to give us our identity. But that's how we experience it in the Kakangelion. That's how we experience it in the bad news. And the same thing with, le with leisure. I mean, oh my gosh, when it comes to leisure, how many of us are in a place where we just can't stop? Like you actually, when you're invited into leisure, we're invited into rest. I can't. Can't stop, I can't stop working, can't stop scrolling, can't stop drinking, can't stop sleeping, can't stop eating. I just, I just need to have more and more. And then we flip from that and just can't stop to crash. These are the two extremes that we experience now in the bad news. We're made for rest, we're made for this leisure that gives more life, but I can't stop. If I do stop, I collapse. We're made for labor, for leisure, we're made for love, and yet what's our experience of love right now? In the bad news, after this fall, after everything gets broken, our experience of love is, is either we're indifferent, like can't be bothered. You know, there's actually a, a movement. Um, it, it's around the world, but in places like Japan. You know, in Japan right now, there are 1.5 million people, maybe even more, who belong to this category that they call hikikomori, which is people who are basically, they've kind of given up on civilization. They don't go out and meet friends. They don't go out and date. They don't even pursue another person to use them. They're simply indifferent to relationships, not just romantic relationships, but all relationships. They're indifferent to friendship. They're indifferent to just even spending time with others. And because of this, there's this reclusiveness. And again, I'm not saying that's their fault. I'm saying it's part of the fault. It's part of what got broken with that first sin. So either we're indifferent, I can't be bothered by relationship, I can't be bothered by other people, or we want to use other people, that lust that gets into our hearts. Where, I mean, I'm just, there's a term, I don't know if you know this at home, but they know this on campus. The uh, last couple of years, instead of having relationships, 
people are having situationships. That kind of that kind of idea that that I don't want to commit to you, I, but I'm willing to use you, and I'm willing to let you use me. That's completely fine. It's a situationship. Just as long as this is happening, this is this is okay. And so again, we're made for love because of this twisting. We're either indifferent to each other, can't be bothered, or we just use each other. And the the reality, of course, is say, well, that's that's bad. That's 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 bad news. But it gets worse. Because if it was only twisted, if it was just broken, that'd be one thing. But we realize this, that by this choice, by, this, by having been deceived, and having chosen against God, the reality is our first parents sold us into slavery. That's, that's the bad news. <laughs> it was bad without twisting. It gets even worse. The worst news is that we've been sold into slavery. This is the cacangelion. Catechism chapter 407, paragraph 407, says this. It says, By our first parents' sin, the devil has acquired a certain domination over man, even though he remains free. Think about that. We were sold into slavery. In that moment, with that choice, Satan, the devil, acquires a certain domination. And that, that word domination means um, uh, control or lord, lowercase l, lordship. So we're born into this world and Satan has a certain kind of lordship over us. He has certain control over us. He has certain kind of domination over us, even though we're free. And, you know, the reality is you're still you. That I, I, we're, we're still us. But we're born into this world, not our own. And I have this image about this. And, and the image is kind of disturbing. I apologize for that. But just kind of, kind of came to me as I was praying about this. Like, okay, you're still you, but you're not free. Have you ever heard of hobbling? So what would happen is like if you, if you had a horse and but you didn't have like a, a fence to tie it to or a post to tie the horse to, what you do is you'd hobble the horse and that, and it doesn't hurt the horse. It's just you basically tie the hooves of the horse together. So the horse can still walk around, walk around. It can still kind of graze a little bit and eat some grass, whatever it needs to eat, but it can't run off. Like it's not, it's not free. In the history of humanity, there have been times when people have been, have hobbled other people and times when maybe they just shackle their feet together, but there's evidence of there being a number of times in history where people would take others and they would crush the, the bones in their feet and in their ankles so that they, they couldn't run off. You, okay, now you're, you're free. Go wherever you could go, but you can't go anywhere. That You want to walk away, but you can't. You're powerless. And I think about this too. I think about this every time I go through an airport, every time, every time I am, I'm in a truck stop. And so in the airport, a lot of times they have, they have signs up there like, hey, if you see something, say something. Because we know this right now, in our modern day and age, human trafficking is at an all-time high. We have never had more human slaves in the world than we do at this moment. Both people who are economically trafficked and people who are sexually trafficked. And so in those, in those airports, there's, there's signs up all over the place saying, hey, if you see something, say something. Um, or in the bathrooms, if you've been at a truck stop, in, in the stalls, there's like, hey, are you right now being held against your will? Call this number. And yet, so they're walking among us. And they, they want to walk away. But they're powerless. Just trapped. Again, been sold into slavery. Hobbled. Like, I, I want this to be different, but I'm powerless. This is the Kakengelion. And again, we all know this is a true story. And so too many of us base our lives on this true story. We know it's true because, I mean, if you go back to St. Paul, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, he says this is he's true. St. Paul even says it about himself. He says, he says, he says, I've been sold into slavery. It's a sin. He says, what I do, I do not understand. For I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil that I do not want. I'm a slave. So the Satan, the evil one, right? He, what does he do? He lies, he deceives, he tempts, and he discourages. Because, okay, you're free, but you're not free. And so it's easy to be in a place where, like, I have no hope. That's one of the reasons why the last enemy to be destroyed. In two weeks, we hear that scripture from St. Paul. The last enemy to be destroyed is, is death. Because we realize there's not one of us. Every one of us is under the power of sin. Right? Every one of us is because of our parents' first sin, we have a certain domination by the evil one. 
but every one of us is gonna die. It reminds me of a, I, when I was a kid, there was a t-shirt and it was also a bumper sticker. I think I saw it on a hat and it was a saying and it's kind of crass, but it, it said, life sucks, then you die. And for many people, that's their true story. That's the story they base their lives on. Life sucks, then you die. St. Paul writes about that in Romans chapter five, where he says, he says, just as through one person, sin invaded the world, right? Just as through the sin of Adam and Eve, sin invaded the world, and through sin, death. Thus, death came to all. Some people base their lives on this story. Life sucks, then you die. Because I'm hopeless, and I'm helpless. I'm going to base my life on that true story. I'm going to base my life on that Kakengelian. I'm going to base my life on the bad news. That's why St. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians today. Because there are people who base their lives on that story. There are people who base their lives on that bad news. There are those who grieve with no hope. There are people who live with no hope. People who have based their lives on the true story of the Kakengelian. But the great news is this. Even in the midst of Act 2, Right? Even in the midst of this fall, even in the midst of this brokenness, even in the midst of this distortion and domination and desperation, God hasn't abandoned us. And paragraph 410 of the Catechism says this. It says, after his fall, man was not abandoned by God. So even in this Kakengelian, right? Even in the midst of the bad news, God didn't abandon us. In fact, in the midst of the bad news, as, as God comes on the scene and he sees, okay, here's what the woman did, here's what the man did, here's what the serpent did. In the midst of all of that consequence of everything just being twisted and all of it being sold into slavery, God speaks in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's, called the, it's a thing called the Proto-Evangelion, right? The, the first trace of the good news, that even in the middle of the Kakengelion, there's this Proto-Evangelion. Genesis 3, chapter 15, where God declares to the, to the evil one, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. And this is the, even in the midst, the darkest moment, there's this first trace, this first promise of the good news. That there was good news and there's bad news, but there's good news to come. And I want to highlight this. What did God say? I'll put enmity between you and the woman. Who's the woman? You know, we get to the Gospels. Some people get disturbed when Jesus calls his mom woman. He's not insulting her. He's highlighting her role. He's not insulting her. He's highlighting her role and his role. That here is this, this person, my mom, Mary. She is the woman who is promised in that first hint of the good news. Because I, Jesus, am the one who was promised that first hint of the good news. And what did he do? I mean, think about this. He announced that the dom domination that Satan has over all of our lives, that domination is at an end. That's one of the reasons why, as Jesus comes on the scene, what does he do? Everywhere he goes, he does exorcisms. Everywhere he goes, he is driving out and demonstrating, I can't, not only can I heal people, not only can I bring people back from the dead, demonstrating that there is no evil. There is no death that can hold people when I get a hold of them. But he also drives out demons, declaring definitively that the beginning of the end has begun. And this is one of the reasons, this is the last thing. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why um, I read a book by an exorcist and he, he has, he's the first person, I think, in the world who ever have a PhD in exorcism. And so he's read, he said he's read everything that the church has ever written on exorcism. And he said the beginning of the church, whenever, not only when Jesus went out, when the apostles went out, whenever the church was a missionary church, right, whenever the church was encountering new cultures, there were... Yeah, exorcisms abounded. Why? Because here are Christians with the power of the Holy Spirit, with Jesus Christ, entering into areas that are dominated by the evil one. All these people who have been made good, had made on purpose, made for a purpose, made for labor and leisure and love, made for God himself. But what happened is they lived under the domination of the evil one. They lived under the slavery to sin. And so whenever the gospel is proclaimed, remember the gospel is the power of God for freedom, for life. Whenever that gospel is proclaimed, they had to have exorcisms. And then what happened is, because then exorcisms kind of dipped. They didn't have a ton in during what you call Christendom. And he, asked, he was asked the question, how come? And he's like, because everyone was baptized. And so even though, yes, we were born under the dominion, dominion domination of Satan, 
our Lord Jesus has already begun setting them free. Now, he says, there's another rise in exorcism. Because people aren't getting baptized. Because Christians who are baptized aren't choosing to allow Jesus to be the one who fights for them. Even after we were sold into slavery, God did not abandon us to the power of death, but helped us to seek and to find him. That's why St. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose, and so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Things are broken. That's the bad news. That's the reality of, of, of life in this world right now. That's the kakengelion. And that is part of the story. But the story isn't over. That, yeah, we live in a world where we've been sold into slavery. But we live in a world that God has invaded. That in Jesus Christ, God fights for us. And because he fights for us, we have hope. And that hope is based on a true story. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He, he suffered, suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for us that we're still, he's evolved in our story. We now approach him with all of our needs. that church leaders throughout the world continue to call all people to holiness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That God's people who proclaim that death has been conquered in Christ may be active in defending his gift of life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who work for peace and struggle for justice will bring the message of salvation to our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that we may work to save orphan children throughout the world, especially those who are abused or neglected. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our beloved dead, especially our family and friends, that they rise with Christ to new life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace this week to fully accept the bad news that we have been sold into slavery as part of the true story we are living out so that we might realize what God is doing for us even now. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. We continue our prayer by offering our Diocese of Duluth prayer for vocations. And as always, please pray for vocations here in our diocese as well as in your home diocese as we pray. Almighty Father, we beg pray you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families, to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. For the praise praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Look with favor, we pray, O Lord, upon the sacrificial offerings offered here, that celebrating in mystery the passion of your Son, we may honor it with loving devotion through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you so loved the world, that in your mercy you gave us, you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you, give you thanks. As an exaltation, we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. 
Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at the passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart, I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you, amen. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me. Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. Let us pray. Nourished by this sacred gift, O Lord, we give you thanks and beseech your mercy, that by the pouring forth of your spirit, the grace of integrity may endure in those your heavenly power has entered. Through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Just once again, an invitation to the Thursday, November 16th, 7 p.m. Uh, come join us. Also, again, if you would like to support the work of this ministry, it'd be awesome if you go to bulldogcatholic.org or to givemn.org anytime this week. You don't have to do it even on the 16th. You can do it anytime. But just if, the, if this ministry has blessed you, uh, just pray about maybe blessing it back. It's, it keeps us um, able to serve our students and keeps us able to do things like this. Anyways, St. Michael. Be our angel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina. Mater misericordiae, vita dulce do, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, exules filii eve, a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in ac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, ilos tuos. Misericorde soculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis, post hoc exilium, ostende. O clemens, o pia, o 